Yeah, we're ready to go. We're ready to go and get started this morning. So let's open the prayer and then we'll have a couple songs. Lord Jesus, we do thank you again today. We ask you tonight, Pastor Don, as you bring us the word. Lord, uh, help those who are away from us today and encourage them and strengthen them. Help those who are here do the same so that uh, we might uh, know. And uh, yeah, we do what we do, but it's nice to know, to know that what we do makes a difference. It is done if it's done in Jesus' name. So help us to do things in your name. We'll give you the praise as you work out uh, that plan of salvation in the lives of those that you've given to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, yeah. It's muddy up here. You'll find it's funny up in this pilot seat here. Things are getting back to normal. You know, there was a a guy you all probably know if you ever watched old Disney movies. He was a villain, Keenan Lynn. He had a big handlebar mustache. His dad was a vaudeville star. When you said co-pilot, they just anyway. He said uh, a vaudeville star and had been for many years. And Keenan says, Dad, because he'd play places like the Capitol Theater, you know, whatever, all over the country. He said, Dad, if you just stop driving or taking a train, a bus, and get on a plane, you could make probably 70 or 80 more venues a year. And you could, you know, make a little bit more money and make it pay what you do, your, your, your bundle act. And he said, uh, and he says, and Dad, Think of it this way. If you get on a plane and it crashes, it was your time. If it's your time, it's your time, right? And the dad's answer was, yes, son. But what I'm afraid, that it might be one of the passengers of the pilot's time. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a good reason not to fly, right? Okay. 224, we'll try that.
I really don't know if we should try this one, but let's do it anyway. 225. I love the song, I just don't. You know what? Thanks a lot. 225, guys. It kind of reaches a higher point there. 23 cases too late. Are you familiar with this one? If not, we yeah, can. Yeah, okay. just have to look at it for a second. Uh, yeah, I'm doing the same thing, so we're on the same page. <laughs> Step on the mouse underneath the camera, you'll hit that high note. Somebody paid for my trip to 
Ecuador, and I just checked to make sure it was a round trip ticket. But <laughs> <laughs> decided to do all of my four years worth of sermons this morning. Are you sharing? Yeah. Well, you we better hurry because I got four years worth of preaching. Um, That's all. This, this Thursday at 6.30, I'm going to be doing my discipleship uh, sort of study. So if anyone wants to attend that, I think it's going to be good. We're going to go over some uh, Christian basics, and then we'll be going over um, anything that anyone wants to go over. So nothing, nothing off limits, no holds barred. It can turn into apologetics, it can turn into study of doctrine, whatever you want to do. Uh, but Thursday, 6.30, I'll pick a light, fun topic, probably something like the Trinity. So, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. But I Thursday, would Julio, I would start with Julio. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll be in the Sunday school room in the back, because there's tables and chairs and air conditioning and all that. All right. And I'll, at least I'll make him give the AC on. Great. And we got the children to go out now. Get out of here, kids. I think they're... Yeah. You know, I was thinking, if you understand our method to the madness is we have these kids up in the mountains and a spiritual event may not take place this, this camping trip. The spiritual event may take place, Jacob, on their next trip when they go, man, it was so much fun to be with the guys in the church. You know, the spiritual event may take place down the road when they think back on that time we were together. Isn't that right? Amen. It's good to have you, man. Camping. We're going to try to get that same location next year because we can kind of just throw the kids into the creek and watch them. And it's kind of muddy, so if they were obnoxious, you could just stick them in the mud and they'd stay there until you were done. Um, it was a good time to be had by all, and I'm so glad that we're able to do it. It was supposed to be Josh's and his son's time back, but we had Adam and we had Scott there with his kids and it was a lot of fun. We did together. We had we had the word from Isaiah last week. Um, I want you to have fun this morning in church. Sorry. I was just wondering, turning this thing on, Marvin, how come when we get older they make the on and off button so that you can't tell which one of the black dots it is? If it was Braille, we'd have the, there's two little bitty things on here, John, that tells you whether your mic's on or not. And when you're back in the restroom, you don't want to push the wrong one. <laughs> it's just not right. Um, we're going to look at one of the... <laughs> there are other ways to present this, and I've had to do it at some... Had to. I got to do it at some weddings, I guess, you know. Uh, 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians is the love, love chapter. Um, I wanted to remind you all before I get lost in my message that uh, Mike's been diagnosed with cancer. You need to pray for him. I'm not even going to tell you what kind it is because I want God to remove it before they really are settled on an issue. And uh, I still believe God can do it. I still believe He does do it. And so we'll pray in faith that God will do that. Uh, let's pray before we start our message today. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your great love for us. I pray that Your Spirit would just bring joy to our hearts, that we would be able to see You in a new and ever-changing way. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Um, I have to fight this wicked headache every so often when I'm making my message and then when I'm delivering, but I will win. First Corinthians, and I wanted to, how many of you ever saw Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? Oh good, there's going to be a couple people that know what I'm talking about. It isn't a great show, don't go get it because I said that. It isn't a great show, but one of the things they do say is it's a most excellent way. And when I saw Paul say the same thing, I'm going, dude, <laughs> it's excellent. In the, the 12th uh, chapter of the 31st verse, he goes, and now I will show you a most excellent way. Excellent. And he goes on in the 13th chapter, the 13th verse, and we'll, we'll, I'm going to go this, I'm going to tear this up. If you want to go home and lock the closet, turn the light on and read it the way it's written, go ahead. But I want to enjoy this today. So it's kind of like, uh, kind of like that Texas Roadhouse dinner we had the other day, with a little bit of juice running down your chin. I love the Texas Roadhouse. I haven't eaten there. Haven't eaten the Texas Roadhouse. Oh, I'm going to pray for you right now that God would drop your 
tire right outside the Texas Roadhouse and you'll get to eat. Here's the 13th verse, and pretend this is a wedding if you like. I would not. Um, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and have all the faith, I can move mountains. Have not love, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I think of all those guys that want to be, you know, I guess I had to choose in my ministry, did I want to save people's minds, or did I want to save people's hearts? And the Lord had me take a right turn and go speak to the heart, Don, speak to the heart, because that's what I died on the cross for. If I give all the possessions to the poor, surrender my body to flames, and don't have love, there's nothing to gain there, people. I don't care what you give up, what heartache you think you endure because you've given too much. Let me say this right off the bat. No one has given too much. That's why Jesus died on the cross to show you what everything was. In verse 4, and we don't even know how to understand this. Love is patient. Man, this thing, getting Josh's thing finished, when you're dealing with the government and you're dealing with three or four agencies, yeah, just go try to file for your retirement. You know what I'm talking about. Love is patient. Love is patient. We don't even understand the word patience. Wow, all this time that God is waiting to redeem his own and we think that he's either not coming again or it's been a long time, he's patient. Not wanting that anyone would perish. Love is kind. Love is kind. In the manual it says to be kind to one another. Do you think you wouldn't have to tell people to be kind? My goodness, I've seen some unkind people in the church and I'm not going to pick on just the church. You just got to walk outside the door to see someone that's not kind. Kindness is, a, is an art. And it does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Oh my, road rage. Not easily angered. It keeps <laughs> no record of wrongs. <laughs> Apparently, there's a gene for... Uh, Drivers that get upset in traffic. I don't think it came from the Fabian Thompson side, but if you ride with a couple people in my family, their kids learn what it's all about. <laughs> How dare you? Never, never, I'm not going to go there. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not even angered. It has. How about this? It keeps no record of wrongs. Well, I remember back in 1942 when they treated me that way. I thank Jesus every day that the people that couldn't forgive me for my youth are now dead. <laughs> no kidding, Angus. There are, there are things that I did that I'm not proud of that I can ask forgiveness for all day long and they'd never forgive me. And I'm sincere. And thank you, Jesus, they went home to be with him. If he can point out the error of their ways. Because they're not breathing down my neck now. Love does not delight. I'm going to have fun with this, folks, so just go along. Love does not delight in evil. And I, and I think uh, the, the, the patriarch of the Pleasant family, I just remember him when he poured my cement slab. I came to work, and I was working at the Employment Security Building, brand new. And the contractor tried to save money on cement, and he raked the seams up to the joints so that it would match. But the centers of every little square in that huge building down there on uh, third and, and whatever that street is and he raked it in there while the inspector came along and put a straight edge down it and he saw all of those things and he went along you're tearing this one out you're tearing this one out you're tearing this it broke it all up and i came home when he was pouring my slab and i said how about that and i said those guys really messed up and i was kind of chuckling that they were doing all this over because they didn't do it right and Mr. Pleasant, what a great Christian spirit, said, oh, we need to pray for them. We need to pray because that's a horrible waste of cement and a horrible waste of manpower. And here's a guy that he's retired from his, at the end, we got him to come back and do my slab. 
to think that he thought that much about those workers that had to do it twice. And I thought, I hope I could be that gracious someday to see someone who's tried to cut a corner, it's her own fault, and still pray for them and love them. That was amazing to me. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It knows no record of wrong. It loves. It doesn't delight, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, it always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Perseveres. I love you no matter what. And what is a capital W? Whatever time, whatever situation, whatever circumstance, whatever. What? What? Always perseveres. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. It's, it's kind of nice to know that some know what all people will pass to. But we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, imperfection disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. And the message that we're going on today in verse 12, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, and then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, this is Paul speaking, now I know in part, but then, I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Now, verse 13. These three things remain. I want you to remember, these are all things you can give each other. These three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But what's the greatest of these? Love. Heavenly Father, bless this word to our hearts, and I hope that I don't carve it up so badly that the message is missed, but that I show it in a new way that is hung onto, that it was gleaned, and, and taken every nugget out of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's interesting to realize, we always had a, a guy working on our crew who always wanted to tell us this. I have to be careful, I'm going to slip into his voice. But our, our worker always said, Glass is a liquid, Don. You have to always remember that. Glass is always moving. It's never a solid and fixed. And every time we'd see a mirror or we'd see a window, well, that's because it's, it's slowly in state of setting up. It's a liquid. I never bought into that, Angus. I never really understood because all the glass I broke was in one place when my rock hit it and off the mower. <laughs> but he said that it's, and it's interesting to realize that no person actually ever sees themselves as they are. I want you to understand that when you look into a mirror, what are you looking at? You're looking at the backward reflection of your body. You look in a mirror, that's not you in there. It's a reverse. So you never see yourself exactly in a mirror. You ever been to one of the houses at the fair where you walk through there? I like the one that makes me look slim and trim. I kind of like the one that makes me look herky and jerky. I don't like the one that makes me look like a snozberry. I don't, I don't like the one that makes me look round and purple. So we never really get to see ourselves as we are that way. And then think about a portrait or a photograph. It's not backwards, but it is only two-dimensional. How many people like to look at their own pictures of themselves? Photographs. Yeah, nobody jumping at that. Yeah, me, me, I'm beautiful. No, because that's a snapshot, a flat dimension, that if you look at that picture closely, you might realize that, number one, do you really look that way? Or number two, do you really look that way? So it's a two-dimensional image. It's not a really accurate depiction of what people see when they see you. Now, you could step on to get three dimensions and do a, a statue. How many ever been to a wax museum? 
How many of you have ever stopped there and go, is that what they really look like? Or that's taller than I thought, or their eyes are different than I thought. And I've seen some really bad wax museums. Yeah, no, Carol Channing does not look like John Wayne. <laughs> but you see, the problem with it is, no one has ever frozen like this at time. So when you look at them, not once did they stay here for days or weeks or months or years. So when you look at that 3D image, how about a bronze statue? It's like one guy that they, one guy that they, and they freeze them there. And it's not really an accurate portrayal of who that person is. We try. My goodness, I know people do a better job than I could ever do. But what Paul is saying here is, now I will show you the most excellent way. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know even also as I am known. Paul gives us a riddle to illustrate what we don't totally understand about the things of life. And one day we will understand those things. And I want to play around with Paul's illustration here a little while. And uh, let's see if we can get a new look. Because I don't ever think that you should let life get old. I don't think you should let life get boring because it's too exciting to live life every day. Everybody breathe in. Amen, Pastor. Life is good. Oh, I want to brag on your house. Those people in the back row live in a nasty place called the Burning Tree. <laughs> and they burned two of their condos down. And the fire went over Mike and Minzy's house with an open 20-year-old shaped roof on it and burnt the house down next to them. Now, I hope the intellectual people in the burning tree are figuring that one out. But I'll tell you what, when you can't figure it out, it's Jesus. God protected it. You didn't even have a rooster get burned. We could have fried chicken. It went over their house next to the two that burned. Wooden roof, John. Burnt the house down there. I have no judgment on the other house. I have no judgment on the people that are burning, but I suspect Marvin was shooting bottle rockets off right before the 4th of July. I want him to look into that, all right? And then your police friend just retired. See? Marvin waited till he retired to get rowdy. <laughs> I want you to laugh. Thank you. The distance between earth and hell proper. You want to know that there's levels to hell. There is the pit that is an abominable place that there is no return from that has a gate. The one that Jesus will throw Satan into and lock the door with no key in the end of ends. And John will tell you what day that's going to be. I won't because I don't know. He may be my elder and wisdom enough to know that. And there's also Hades, which is like hell light. It is not permanent. It is the place of the holy. And it is the place that all of those who died in faith waiting for the Messiah to come were held until his death on the cross. When he set the captives free, they were held there until their faith could be rewarded by the presence of the Messiah because their lives had already ended. But we know the difference between the two is, I'll show you, in hell there is torment. And when the rich man looked out and saw this, and it wouldn't have been included, oh, all of this is in the Bible, so you choose to believe it, or you choose what other parts of the Bible you don't want to believe. But the, but the rich man says, look, there's Abraham and Lazarus next to him. Could you have him come and just put a little bit of water on my tongue? It is so hot, and he's in hell. Could you have him come down and just touch? And remember what Jesus said? I can't. You can't. There's a great chasm between hell, you ain't coming back, and where you're at and where you'll go. And he said this. Then let me go tell my brothers. It's amazing. I know that when we pray with people and they pass away, 
um, when they receive Christ on their deathbed, they always come back with, but what about my wife? What about my kids? I've met Jesus. How can they know him too? And here is the rich man going, I know you are the son of God. How can I tell my family to not be like me, to change their ways? Well, you know the answer is that he wouldn't even believe if I came and died for him. It's up to each one of us to choose. It's up to each one of us to decide to follow Christ. And so uh, he looked up and saw him far away by his side. Now, in Luke 16, and besides this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to there can not, nor can anyone cross over from here to us. It can't happen. It can't happen. It can't. And, and I thought about this, and I thought about it for a long time. There is stuff in that pit that would literally scare the hell out of us. There is stuff that has been locked up that is so heinous our minds can't comprehend. And God purposely doesn't allow it to come in to our realm. That's pretty scary thinking. Now, you can all expand on this all you want. I don't have time to go into all of the different angles that there's played here, but thank God there's a big chasm between that place and here. And, and, and I want you to know that in Hades, that means then those uh, other powers, those other forces, aren't as bad as them. And there in Hades, the place of the dead, Sheol, it's the earth... Um, it's not so well defined in Sheol. Sheol is that place um, some of the evil hasn't been cast out yet in this world. And it is not that what evil does when we see it. It's what evil does when we don't see it that we should be worried. And so we know that there is a place, another dimension that people go into. And, and I've even looked into it so far as when someone passes away, how soon do they go to the realm and how far is the realm from their death to here? You can go on the, you know, years ago you couldn't, but now you can go find all kinds of books where people have gone to heaven and returned, have gone to Sheol and returned. I don't, I don't know. I just love Jesus with all my heart and my soul. Amen? Amen. That's the best you can do. That's the best I can do. But it's amazing to know that there is evil out here. There is evil in the world. And my dad gave me the confidence to know that those horrible things can't get me. And my Bible gave me the confidence to know that with Christ in my heart, they can't have me. Because I'm in the hands of the Almighty God. And He is greater. And always remember this. Evil is not here. And God is here. Evil is here, and God is here. It's not a battle between good and evil. Not, not on that scale. Of, oh, one's going to top the other one. Not going to happen. It's already been settled. It's already been done. There's no question that He is the Almighty Father, the righteous God who's in control of all, and all-powerful, and all-knowing, and all-seeing. And so we see that. Um, several times in the Bible it's interesting for those of us who want to intellectually uh, be assimilated into heaven where the earth break open and the dead walked in their midst at the time of Christ's crucifixion and it's possible for a priest who did a service for a, one of the flock to see them walking on the street. It's possible that God can raise the dead. Maybe you missed that. And it's possible that's his dimension. It's his business. So don't get overwhelmed in it. Here was the one. Um, Houdini spent a long time debunking spiritualists. And he said to his wife, he wanted to test how far this veil between the dead and the living was. He wanted to get the answer of the questions we just talked about. And <clears throat> he told his wife, he said, wait for me on Halloween, the anniversary of his death, and I would contact her. 
And after 10 years, they interviewed her and they said, well, what do you, what do you think about this? She goes, 10 years is long enough to wait for a man. I quit. And she didn't look for him ever again. So we see then that the distance between heaven and earth is another distance that is, is worth looking at because I almost think that up there alongside the creek or in the creek sitting on my chair with my hat wet was pretty close to heaven. Have you ever been to that place? You say, whoa, God, stop this thing. I don't want time to go on because it doesn't get any better than this. Well, we know that it will in heaven, but this is about as good. We have a heavenly glimpse through the veil because the fabric was torn between heaven and earth. Did people look through the veil or did they just see things come through the veil? You want to remember that was the star of David the one that came through the veil so that shepherds and wise men could see it? Or did the veil pull away so they could see the star? Did the wise men catch a glimpse of the other side? Or did the other side come near them so they could see? Did the shepherds have the choir loft open up so they could see thousands of angels, a great multitude of the heavenly host? I think that's short for a gazillion or a bazillion or whatever. Or did they come out from the other side to put on a concert? on that hillside that night. When God opened up the fabric, how incredible is it that He would slide Himself into our world as a baby. And maybe He came as a baby so that you wouldn't be afraid because He's an awesome God. And everyone I know that got a glimpse of... A glimpse of look, at, look at poor Moses. I mean, look at Charles and Heston. His hair went white. Oh, man! Can you believe having white hair because you saw God? Everyone that took a look at the cover of me up so that you can see my backside. Instead, to be our Savior, He came here as a baby. Now, I haven't seen very many homely babies. And if I did, I know enough to keep my mouth shut. But imagine God present Himself as a baby. <laughs> John's chuckling to himself there. He wanted us not to be afraid of him. He is God. He walked in front of mankind and we can follow him. Just, I wish we knew more about his junior high years because I tended to have a little problem then. I could have used a little more instruction, but I guess he knew even that would pass. So we saw him grow in stature and insight. And it was remarkable how this young boy could go before the Sanhedrin and talk to them, and at the end of their meeting go, oh, what did you say? I can't believe it. Really? You understand this in a way that I never even read it? And Jesus just totally befuddled them. And and I don't know about you, but the last time I got lost from my folks, I probably got a whooping. Now, he didn't get a whooping. What is that? He had this presence that we could see. He grew in stature and his insight was remarkable and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. It was God reaching from the other dimension into our world. This is a, Are you with me on this? Do you understand that there is a veil between what's so close to us? How close is heaven? Well, I can tell you, Adam, how close hell is. Go dress shopping with your girlfriend. Well, your fiance. There's some things that are just that way. That it seems like the most hardest thing we've ever experienced. But we also know heaven is the same. To be so at peace with your mate, with your loved one, to be at peace with them is good. Um, God reveals himself to us in so many ways, if we'll open our eyes and just see it as God's working in our hearts and lives. And, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, what did it say? The veil was torn but nothing, top to bottom. And it goes back to the last sermon we did here. Why did he do that? Because it wasn't about 
the barrier between heaven and hell. He did that so his spirit could come from the holiest of holies to our hearts without any restriction, without any flaws, to be able to walk into our hearts, to be his bride, to be his best friend. No hidden God. I don't, these other religions that have, well, you can only ascend to this level before you can really see the answer to your questions. Or, oh, somebody hid in a closet and made this stuff up and it's accurate. No, he broke open the veil so that he could come forward to us. Us knowing that he was born a baby. Us knowing that he died on the cross. Us knowing that he went and freed the captives. That he ascended to the Father. That he came for us. That he could be there with each and every one of us. Not one guy for 12. Not one guy for 10. One guy for one guy. One guy for one gal. To give us spirit. To give us help. To give us the insight that he can give. To lead us into all truth. To guide our hearts and lives. The temple was torn in two. And it's not an accident. It's not an accident. I think if I was the priest on duty that day, what would you tell your boss? Uh, well, uh, the kids were playing with the ball. And no, God came and visited this earth and walked through the veil. Whatever the depth and the, and the width of it. We know that it was probably... Well, I've heard some guys say, Adam, I've heard him say this deep, 18 inches, the veil. I've seen some say a little bigger. It tore in two. It tore in two. And yes, now we see through a glass darkly into the truth of ancient days. Why did those things happen that way, God? How did you do it? And, and I want to tell you, I want to say this, and I'm going to say it again. The plan of salvation was so, I hate to use the word goofy because I like goofy, but that's not it. It was so strange that Satan couldn't figure it out. That it was so genius in its simplicity that a baby would come in a manger and destroy the religion of this world to bring his spirit to our hearts today. And it, and it worked. And it worked. There are millions of people around the earth on this Sunday worshiping that God and that spirit and that truth. You and I would not have, I would have, I would have assembled the armies. And uh, you know, can I just tell you to think of that one joke about the little boy in Sunday school? When the you know that joke, right? I'd have to say it again. The preacher I use the same joke, but I love that one where say, What did you study today? Because well, I, I studied uh, crossing the Red Sea. You, raise your hand if you heard that. I'm not going to tell it again. <laughs> two, only two of you? Only my family? Yeah. All right, little boy comes home from Sunday school. Sits down at the table. Mom and Dad says, well, what did you do in Sunday school today? Oh, we studied the Exodus from uh, Egypt, from the God's people. He goes, oh, really? He says, well, were you paying attention? What happened? He goes, well, thought for a minute. He said, Dad, they sent out a reconnaissance crew, and they took some beams, and they built a bridge right across the Red Sea, and they brought all the people across, and when they got to the other side, they looked back, and Pharaoh was coming, and they hit the switch, and it blew the bridge out. And the dad goes, oh, What? Mom goes, well, I'm going to have words with that Sunday school teacher. Cause he goes, no, 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 don't do that, Mom and Dad. Don't do that. I'm just, I'm just telling you that because you'd never believe what they really said happened. <laughs> so I had to do that. I just, now we see through a glass darkly. Yes, the power of the Spirit allows us privileges and insights that have never been granted before. We can have communion with God. Do you understand the sacrifice thing? Do you understand the bloodletting? Do you understand the wine and the bread? And to realize it all comes to the point that he wants to have dinner with you in your heart. He wants to commune with you. He wants to share with you in your heart. Do we get it? Well, God gave a lot of information for us to digest and to respond positively. The greatest illustration was Jesus. The greatest act was Him giving His life for us. And we still can see the shadow of God through it all. The image of Christ. 
There is a veil between reality and the spiritual word world. But when we go through hard times, when we go through difficult times, God reveals himself in special ways. God comes through for us. God gives us those kinds of events in our lives. Why? I've never gone farther away from God from an adversity. I've always been drawn to my knees and I've always been drawn to God because he allows those things. I want to say it again. He's not biting his fingernails about your tough times here on earth because he knows what we should know. This ain't all there is. This isn't it. One day, he will return again and he will say, come to me, my faithful servant. And in the midst of this, I want you to be happy for I've overcome. I want you to have a joy that can only come from me because the world's not going to understand it when you can smile. The world's not going to understand it when you can endure such hardship and come through it saying, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you because they're all going to go, what? What? What is there about those people? What is there about that situation? It is simply the most exciting and incredible things that we on her, here on earth as mortal beings can go through. To look at the things of God through the veil. We don't need to see all of the detail. We have the best vision of anybody on the planet. So now we see through a veil, a glass darkly. <laughs> But then we'll know. Then we'll know. You don't have to guess. God will bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you a peace that the world doesn't know. A peace that the world doesn't understand. And if you become nasty, cratchy, bitter people, he died in vain. Enjoy yourselves. Enjoy the who that we are. I, I am still so proud of you people. I am so proud of you because I know similar situations that we've been through where the people are all alone. Are all alone. We're going to continue to lift up the Lord. We're going to continue to look through that glass and go, well, I see it. That's Jesus. I see what's going on here. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that even though we don't have all the answers, and even we don't need all the answers, we have enough. We have enough. Everything that's enjoined in scriptures here is to send us to a heart relationship with you. Forgive us of the things that we fail in. Help us to be stronger, to be more like you. And Lord, we just pray that we'll continue to look through the glass, to move forward, and always think the positive in the dark times. Lord, bless us now. I pray for Mike. Would you just touch his body now? Would you heal him right now so that the doctors would be in awe and go, what happened? Lord, let you be what happened. Help our lives to be a shining testimony to the power of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I mean, I heard a young minister on the radio the other day, and he goes, you're just, you're just wasting your time if you're going to try to be like Jesus. What kind of theology is that, Adam? <laughs> it's heresy. We're every day to emulate our master. Why do they call us Christians?